Welcome to It's More Than Grit, the CSIS podcast about the crucial role entrepreneurs play in the global economy. I am Mariana Campero. And I'm Andrew Schwartz. Join us as we hear stories of both triumphs and setbacks and how economic and policy environments across the globe shape their outcomes. Let's dive in and learn why being a successful entrepreneur takes more than just grit. In today's episode, I spoke with Eduardo de la Mayora, the founder and CEO of Butterfly. We discussed how he's using technology to provide life insurance to millions that have always been uninsured and how he's rewarding their healthier lifestyles. We also spoke about his journey to become a multi-year Ironman winner and how his vision for a company with purpose has inspired him and millions. I hope you enjoy it too. Eduardo, what a pleasure to have you on the show today. Honestly, thank you so much for being here. Mariana, thanks for the invitation. Happy to be here. A great investor once told me that a real entrepreneur usually also has a track record of success. For example, they were once the young kid that won the best robot competition or the kid that was passionate about tennis and won all of the trophies. But this really means that they have always been purpose-driven. Eduardo, I cannot think of anyone more purpose-driven than you. I mean, you're not only the founder of Butterfly, you're also an Ironman champion. I mean, talk about grit, right? You're in your 40s. You have already been named by EY as the World Entrepreneur of the Year. Bloomberg has recognized you as among the 500 most influential people in Latin America. Please tell us your story. How did you jump from this cushy job in New York uh, to Tanzania, then Ironman champion, and now in Chile? <laughs> Being an entrepreneur is not very different than, you know, living living life, I guess. And I think I've been very lucky in my life to be a very passionate and an obsessive person when it comes to do things I do on a personal and professional level. I'd say that trade has been with me since very young. When I was very young, tennis, I remember, was my first passion. And tennis, it was the only thing I could think about. I remember when I was 13, 14, my friends would start dating and going to parties I just wanted to play tennis and play tennis and play tennis and play tennis, what looked as an obsessive way. And I've applied that to my personal life, to my professional life. I always share the story at JP Morgan, 10 years I worked there. I really loved what I did. I did it because I was in love with my profession. I think that allowed me to excel maybe in a way that others didn't. You know, it allowed me to go through that journey with a, a deep passion uh, towards finance, as, as crazy as that sounds, right? And yeah. then un until it wasn't. And then <laughs> finance turned into triathlon and then into better fly. But yeah, I believe purpose is a powerful force. You know, there's a saying, I don't know who's the original author, but you know, for all listening, it says the meaning of life is to find your gift. And the purpose of life is to give that gift away. And we all have two lives. Discovering our gift is the first part of our lives. And the second part is giving that gift back. And some of us discover our gift later in life. Some people discover their gifts when they're, you know, two years old, others when they're 80. But I think those two journeys of discovering what's your, your gift, your ikigai, what you're uniquely qualified to do is one part of life. And the other one is just giving it back. And Have you found yours? I think I have with ups and downs because many times when I share this, it's like, ah, so it's, it's, it's an easy route. And I think finding your gift has a lot to do with the struggles you find along the way. It has to do with grit. It has to do with persevering with things that are not working the way you want them to work. And, um, and I would say I'm, I'm very lucky to have traveled through life in that way. And today, you know, my passion and all my heart is poured into Butterfly as it was right 10 years ago, maybe into triathlon, Ironman training. And I can share that story, how that started. And before that, tennis, before that, JP Morgan, before that, engineering. I really loved engineering and everything in that road. I'm just lucky to be doing what I love wake up in the morning with a smile in my face, with deep passion and, and appreciation. That's been a little bit of my journey. Betterfly was something that happened along the way when I was training for triathlon, trying to become the best in the world. And I connected a couple of things that happened earlier in life, what I was doing at the moment, and, and the company was born. 
let me take you back there. If I am right, Butterfly was born after another idea or another name called Burn to Give. So how did you come up with the idea of Burn to Give and how did you make it come to life? Burn to Give was, was actually, it's Butterfly, it's just the, the earlier name of the company. 2014, I quit my job at JP Morgan. I was at the top of my professional career, working in m in New York, 35 years old, living the dream, to be honest, right? Single at the moment. And a personal life event made me change what I was doing. My mom got diagnosed by a very severe form of leukemia. She's doing well today, but at that moment, she wasn't. That life event made me rethink what I was doing in life. I started asking myself at 35, you know, I lived in Manhattan, in the Upper West, and I was walking to work, and I, I said to myself, what would happen? if you got hit by a bus tomorrow where you went to work? How, how would you measure your life? Would you measure it by your professional success? Would you measure it by the money you have in the bank? Would, how would you measure it? And I started a very personal reflection process about the meaning of life at 34, right? 35. Now, after a while, I came to a conclusion that a good way to measure my life would be how I was using my skills, my time, my energy, God's gifts, whatever my uniqueness to make an impact in other people's lives. I started asking myself, what am I doing today, year 2014, to, to make that happen? I could not answer that question. So I went to my boss. You know, they had just promoted me, by the way, two weeks before. And I told him, e Poncho, I'm leaving the bank. And he's like, what? What? <laughs> Where are you going? Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley. And I'm like, no, I'm moving to Africa. To Africa? What, what are you going to do to Africa? <laughs> And uh, I, I told him, look, I don't know. I just want to spend six months, you know, focusing my time, my energy and helping others. And then I'll come back to normality. And in that journey, two things happened that planted the seeds to what would become Betterfly and Burn to Give at that moment. One has to do with childhood malnutrition and the other one has to do with Ironmans and triathlons. How do you connect those two? Try to make a, a very long story short there. But the first thing is that I went to do volunteer work with elementary school students in, in Tanzania. And after a couple of weeks, I discovered, I faced, you know, the, the reality of childhood malnutrition. This is something that in Chile, where I'm from, and in the U.S. Is, is almost completely eradicated, right? In this part of the world, we have the opposite problem, malnutrition for overnutrition, not, not, not undernutrition. And for me, it was, a, it was a really big contrast coming from all the abundance in New York, everything that we have there to working with kids that did not have food to eat and that would die because of that. And the contrast, my God. It, it, the contrast was huge. I mean, my class, just to give you an idea, a third of my students had AIDS. A little over half were orphans and almost 70% were malnourished. And that just touched me very deeply. But let's leave that for a second. That was not part of the plans. And the second thing that happened in, the, in that journey in Africa, nothing to do with Africa, and these are one of those things that the universe, you know, God puts in your way. I was one night, you know, going to sleep and I came across a video on YouTube of the Ironman World Championships in Hawaii. I'd never done a triathlon. I've never done Ironman. I was not fit at all. I was an overworked, overweight banker. I was 20 kilos heavier. That's like 45 pounds heavier than I am today. Tennis was a long gone dream. You know, I hadn't played tennis for 20 years. And I saw that video and it was very inspiring because it was a race that seemed impossible to do, but it was done by people that were average Joes, people that were just committing, persevering, had a ton of work ethic. And I started thinking, Eduardo, what, what happened to your passion of, you know, of tennis or sports when you were young? And that got me to sign up for a local race, not an Ironman, but a local triathlon when I moved back to Chile. So I moved back to Chile, started exercising. I started losing the extra pounds of weight I had. And in one of these bike rides in Farellones, which is a skiing, one of the mountains near Santiago, this crazy thought crossed my mind. And I said, what if the pounds I'm losing, I could convert them into pounds of food for these kids I met in Africa? What if these calorie cords, I could convert them to calories of food? And what if we could use this desire that we have as human beings to help others, to help every person and use it as an incentive to get people healthier, happier, and uh, living better lives? So that's why Burn to Give, Burn Calories to Give Calories started, right? And the company got started up after that. And the trick is who would pay for me to burn my calories? Exactly, exactly. And the, the original model was very different. And I'll share in a second how we went from Burn to Give to Betterfly, but that's how it started. When I got back to Chile, and this is maybe something that a lot of People hearing this will relate after six months of volunteering and everyone would tell me congratulations, incredible what you did. And what I would feel was that the one that had been touched and, you know, impacted was me significantly more than the kids I helped. The possibility to help others, you know, for six months was a gift that 
I knew I was privileged to have. The vision there was, what if we could bottle that feeling up and use technology to do these micro feelings of purpose for people with their daily physical activity? That's how the company got started under, under Burn to Give in 2018. What an incredible story. I mean, I could ask you a thousand questions uh, to continue, but let me move forward. How did Burn to Give and that model become what Butterfly is today? Why did you add insurance? a really good question. And it also connects both to my personal and professional story. One of the things I heard from a mentor starting when I committed to build a company was you really have to believe in what you're doing because the name of the game in building your company, look, I'll go back to grit again. It's grit. It's, it's, it's resilience, right? You're going to fall down so many times that, you know, this is like an Ironman race. The, the one who wins is the one that gets up the most amount of times. And, and to be resilient, you really have to love and really believe what you're doing. If you're doing it for extrinsic motivators, for being a unicorn, or you, it's not going to be enough. That, that, that will come. It will be a consequence, but you really have to find deep inside why you are doing what you're doing. Why we pivoted from Burn to Give to Betterfly, and more than the pivot that was part of the original model, is that when I was young, when I was 15 years of age, my dad passed away in a dramatic accident. I shared, you know, my dream was to, to become a tennis player. I was in route to do that. I played the U.S. Opens and juniors. It was my dream. And my dad passed away and uh, he did not have life insurance coverage or any type of coverage. And my family, you know, not only did I lose the person I love the most in this world, but my family went into bankruptcy, basically, right? I could not afford tennis anymore. I had to start working to pay for school. And I experienced what millions of, of Latin Americans and millions of people around the world experience that when they don't have the proper financial protection. That life story, I later connected that at JP Morgan. They're a little bit over 10 years in M&A. And most of my work was in the insurance industry because I really wanted to work and understand why a product that I believed was so necessary for so many people was only available for the small minority of people around the world. After 10, 15 years of working and building financial models about insurance companies, particularly life and supplemental accident, which was the branch I was working in at JP Morgan, something that was very clear to me was that, you know, policyholders or people who live healthier, happier lives also live longer, right? And that is something that, you know, insurers also want. It's very uncommon that an industry, you have the same objectives. People want to live longer lives and insurers want people to live longer lives. And healthier lives, exactly. And healthier lives, right? right? Healthier and longer lives. Mortality and morbidity to go down. The vision was What if we could create a platform that not only empowered people to live healthier, happier lives and protect their health and their communities, but could protect their families at the same time? And what if we could create this infrastructure? We could create literally, and that was the first vision, the world's first life insurance coverage that people could build with their hands and their feet instead of their wallets, right? What would happen if we could bundle purpose, well-being, and insurance in an all-in-one solution to empower people to live healthier lives? And that's what we did. We basically said, look, let's create a solution, uh, you know, a, a health and wellness solution that empowers people to live healthier, happier lives. It connects them with intrinsic motivators of, you know, social impact, you know, charitable donations, helping others. Let's use the P&L power of big insurance companies. Let's partner up with the biggest insurance companies in the world, which are completely aligned and, and they should be the ones who pay for preventative health care, preventative, you know, lifestyle changes in society. And they will be the first ones to save. Yeah. They will save a lot of money. Exactly. They will save. There's a financial incentive for them to do that. The thing is, there hasn't been the infrastructure, the technology infrastructure to make that happen. And we will be able at some point in time to unlock the biggest resource of capital to human well-being, flourishing and health and happiness. That was, Mariana, the long-term vision. Long-term, I say, five, six years ago. And today that vision is becoming a reality, particularly not because of what we've built, but because of AI. It's just incredible and happy to share there what we're doing. And that's when we, in 2018, we launched Burn to Give. 2020, we said, let's create this all-in-one insurance, well-being and impact solution where we partner up with the the world's largest carriers to empower individuals to live healthier, happier lives. And, And it's been a little bit over three years since we launched Betterfly, even even though we are, you know, we're present in eight markets, Latin America and Spain, we're a pretty new company, I would say, right? Three years is not that much for the scale we've gotten to. So in a way, it was all my years at JP Morgan, seeing the fundamentals or the, I would say, a first principles approach in terms of how the insurance industry is built. 
And at the same time, aligning that with individual health, happiness, and longevity. Let me ask you one question about Latin America, and I assume other emerging markets. Why is it that so few people actually have life insurance policies? I mean, it is not part of the culture. It's not part of the culture. So there's a bunch of reasons. First, there's the behavioral or present bias. So life insurance is one of those few products that none of us will ever use, right? It's a product that you buy and you literally buy yeah, exactly. and never use, right? So it's a product, as they say, that gets sold, not bought. It's not like car insurance where you buy a car and you, you have to buy insurance. Here, you know, it's something that you have to have a foresight. Human bias is to say, you know what? Okay, I have other expenses. I'll think about that later, later, later. And when later comes, it's too late. And it's a product that because of high distribution costs, right, and complexity of the product, it's been catered towards higher net worth individuals and also bigger corporate clients. Mostly life insurance is distributed individually. And in Latin America, that high cost to sell and to serve that product has made the penetration significantly lower than other markets. And I assume that's where AI comes to play. Exactly. AI, at the end of the day, what's allowing is to bring those costs of distribution significantly down. And that one of the things that we built at Betterfly, we said, look, let's distribute life insurance and now other insurance products like Netflix and Spotify. Let's build a tech stack, right, that brings these distribution costs down significantly. And we cannot serve, you know, a company with 150 employees if we go back and forth asking them for pre-existing conditions, this and that. We have to distribute this just as Netflix, right? So let's build a tech stack, a software that bundles insurance and non-insurance products, which is easy to distribute and sell. And that's the main reason why insurance and particularly life insurance penetration is so low in LATAM. Now, having said that, it's also low in developed markets. I mean, if you look at the US, if you look at Europe, but let's use the US, even though it's the largest market, it's still very underpenetrated because of this present bias, because life insurance is something for people who are wealthy and people who are really thinking about the future. And that's where gamification and everything that we do around that comes into play. How do you see your market? What is the size of the market you want to attack? Betterfly has basically two markets we attack. It's all of them in the insurance world. It's one is the employee benefits market. So we go into employee benefits and sell Betterfly to companies for their employees. And the second one is Betterfly, we partner with insurers to go to their policyholders. You know, a definition of B2B to C market. And if you look at employee benefits, today we have roughly 3,000, a little bit over 3,000 corporate clients. And that might seem a lot, but if you look at it on a global scale and you look at the SMB market, which is the most untapped market in the world, there's roughly 400 million SMBs in the world. Of those 400 million, 95% of them do not have group benefits or group insurance in place. And the reason behind that is because the cost to sell and to serve is very high. If you look at companies, enterprise clients, companies with more than 1,000, 2,000 employees, 99.99% of them do have group insurance and group benefits. So you look at that stat and you say, wow, that's a huge market potential. It's probably the biggest blue ocean in fintech or insurtech on a, on a global scale, right? And that one of the two markets we're, we're addressing. So we're going towards SMBs and each iteration of AI, ChatGTP 3, 4, 5, allows us to go down and down smaller companies in a more cost-effective way right, in personalize and sell. That's a trillion dollar market. So if you look at a company, the biggest expense of companies are payroll. That's like 70% of the expense. The second biggest expense, is benefits. It's a huge market. Every company needs it. Unfortunately, every company does not have it. The other one is the overall insurance, life and health insurance market. More than health, I would say supplemental health. So accidental, dental, vision, uh, medical exams, right? So defined more as critical illness, right? Uh, products. Um, and that market is a $3 trillion market today. AI, right? This is very, very interesting. It's pretty exciting for the insurance industry. I'm one of those people that is excited with the insurance industry that every time I say it, people are like, why are you so excited about the insurance industry? And if you look at the insurance industry, how they've traditionally done under, right? So underwriting for those who are not familiar is how you price and how you sell a product. It hasn't changed in 15, 100 years. It's, it's, it's gone digital. But at the end of the day, let's take life insurance. If you, Mariana, get a life insurance policy, they will ask you your age, if you smoke or not, if you have pre-existing conditions, and maybe the health record. That's it. Before they did it on paper, now they do it digitally. And they do it like a picture, one point in time. So if you buy an insurance policy alive, they will tell you, okay, you answer these questions, 
$100 for million dollar policy. The, the probability of you dying or not or your longevity doesn't have to do with those four questions. Those four questions are important, but they change in time. And there's many other factors, lifestyle factors, that affect how pricing and underwriting should be done. And it should be more like a movie versus a static point in time. That's where we're going towards building a dynamic underwriting model that will change the way on how insurance companies price. And it will bring costs down, allowing more and more people to receive these products. This is how you tie the previous part of your conversation. You want people to exercise and then they will win points or whatever so that you will be able to know exactly sort of how healthy or their behaviors that would be applied towards their policies. Exactly. And that's what we've done the last three years, just to put it more concretely, with the good habits of Betterfly's members and users, they've triggered not only millions of dollars to charitable donations, but we've given over $300 million of no-cost life insurance as rewards for their good habits. Imagine using insurance as a force for good, insurance as an incentive to get people active and healthy. I'll use you, Mariana. I'll tell you, look, Mariana, you go for a one-hour workout, okay? You will burn 600 calories, and I'll give you $600 of no-cost life insurance because that workout not only made you healthier and happier today, but you're living longer, healthier lives. That's what we've done, and that's where we're using insurance, rewards, and incentives to encourage people to take action today and make it a little bit more tangible than the longevity. Because if I tell you, look, you're going to live 90 years instead of 87 years, that's not going to move the needle today for you to work out or not. But if I tell you, look, if you go for a workout, and you I'll cut give you, $50 from my policy, I will do it. I cut $50 for your policy and I'll g allow you to do a free charitable donation to the cause you like. That's more tangible today and that will nudge you to take action, right? So that connection is what we've done. What is the response you're getting? It's huge. You know, I was sharing yesterday in a conference, what is the impact that AI is going to have in the world? This is probably some of the things you've brought in this podcast and, and, and you can ask many entrepreneurs, but one of the best analogies for me is to do with refrigeration. If you look 100 years back when refrigeration was invented, it was one of those huge inventions, humanity, and the people who invented refrigeration made a lot of money, but the people who made the most amount of money or created the biggest change was Coca-Cola, for example. What are the Coca-Colas today of the world? It's, it's companies that have a unique data asset, data mode, that can provide a tremendous value that before was difficult. For us, it's the behavioral data linked to uh, financial protection, to insurance, which in the next years, and this is not me saying this, this is McKinsey, right, saying this, in, in the next years, not 10, not 20, in the next five years, this will create an additional $1.2 trillion only in the insurance industry because insurance companies will be able to price and underwrite products in a way they haven't been able to do in 100 years. And that is going to basically flip the industry upside down. And that's why I'm so not only bullish, but excited about what's to come because that, that's going to depend on what are the next iterations of AI bringing it? What are the insights, the patterns we can start building? And it's going to be iterative. It's not going to be a magic pill that is going to come. It's working. And we've been seeing this for the last year and a half. Every iteration of AI, every new model that comes allows us to do a little bit more, a little bit more. It's just exciting. We're able to serve and, and get to people. Imagine connecting this with my personal story, right? Today, we have 1.2, 1.3 million people using Betterfly, uh, you know, every month. 70 to 80% of them, it's the first time they have a life insurance coverage ever, right? Or any type of coverage. And I connect that with, you know, the story I shared earlier of, of my dad and putting my purpose to work every day and it, it just fuels me up and, and something I'm, I'm very excited about. And I assume that is the reason why you made Betterfly a B corporation. You were described as the first Latin American social unicorn. Uh, you know, sort of, I assume that was really part of it, part of that important decision. So that's a really good question. So we're not only the first Latin America US-based B Corp, and public benefit corporations. So those are too similar, but not the same thing. B Corp is a certification. Public benefit corp, we went a step further, and we have a fiduciary duty to have an environmental and social return at the same level of our financial return, which is super powerful. And also, we took it a step further. We created last year, and this is probably a conversation for another day, but a new type of financial instrument called the Social Impact Stock Units last year. We announced it in the New York Stock Exchange in March 2023, which basically is a type of stock option for NGOs, which is linked to Betterfly's growth. So what does it mean? The more Betterfly grows, a percentage of the company gets allocated 
for free to NGOs across the world. So in five years, if we continue the growth path that we're in, the biggest shareholder of Betterfly is not going to be me, my brother. It's going to be the planet and society, right? So we're creating a new type of business, right? That, uh, I mean, this is Patagonia. Exactly. Patagonia is the only one that's done in a little bit more extreme, but it's Patagonia with a VC funded company, right? Which, and this was aligned with all the... You also have to respond to your investor. Because we have to provide financial return or, or else this doesn't work. But these stock options basically get triggered and it's it's a very nice... You told me you were, you know, you talked to, to Linda and Endeavor. She went there to, to the New York Stock Exchange because we want to share this and there's hundreds of other entrepreneurs that are, have started to apply this in their companies. And it's, it's a very uh, unique model in a way that the day Betterfly IPOs or the day Betterfly gets acquired by another company, these CISUs, social impact stock units, will get triggered and it will be tens and hundreds of millions of dollars to NGOs across the, the, the globe. You choose the NGOs? The users choose the NGOs. So the beauty is that we allocate that proportionally to what users choose in the app. The users that use Betterfly, you can choose to feed a child, plant a tree, provide clean water to community. So you can choose when you're using Betterfly and then we allocate this according to that program. Eduardo, is it hard for you to come out of Latin America and try to really make your company global? You know, usually in Latin America, we have the opposite examples. People trying to replicate the models that already existed in other parts of the world. You're doing the exact opposite. How is that experience? Yeah, so one of the things of dreaming big that I mentioned earlier have to do with that, right? I mean, we're creating, in a way, a new category and a completely new category. In a, one of the biggest industries in the world, which is the insurance industry. And at the beginning, everyone thought, not only crazy, but they would tell me, how many times in Latin America has this happened? You know, because the, you know, the unicorns, the big success stories at that moment were, you know, in a way or form replicating what had worked in developed markets and applying it in a very successful way in Latin America. But that for me has been part of my drive at the same time and showing that from a small country like Chile and most southern part of the world, you can create category, a company like the one we're creating and one of the biggest industries in the world. And that is also part of our Betterfly effect, what we want to show not only for other entrepreneurs in Latin America, other entrepreneurs in India, in other regions in the world that you don't have to, again, be incorporated in, in Silicon Valley, in New York only to create categories, new companies, the Ubers, the, you know, the Airbnbs of this world. And that's part of our mission. And uh, even though we're just getting started, you know, it's, uh, it's a big part of what we're doing. We haven't launched in the U.S. yet. We're preparing the, the launch now. We're in Latin America and in Spain, and I can share in Spain, it's been pretty incredible. They think we come from the U.S., not from Latin America. We have a bunch of anecdotes there, but the U.S. is coming in the next six to nine months. We're in the process of choosing our, our partners there, and it's, it's part of the dream. It's part of what we're building. It's part of the, the obstacles that I mentioned also in the way, right? Building a global company from Latin America, not even from Latin America, from the Brazils and the Mexicos, from Chile to the world, right, is a, is a big ambition, but something that something we're very proud about. How do you manage to train for the Ironman and at the same time to make Betterfly be such a growing company? It really takes more than grit. What is it? Perseverance, state of mind. You don't sleep. It's passion. It's being very, very focused. I think focus comes down to more than focusing to eliminating things that distract you towards what you really want to achieve. I think in life, you have to choose two or three battles, uh, you know, or, or missions at the same time. It's impossible to you train for an Ironman, do a company, meet with your friends two times per week. And today, my, my focus is Betterfly. It's my family and it's my, my health and well-being, Ironman. Two out of those three. And I just choose that. And what does that mean? I have to eliminate Social media, I have to go to bed every day at 9, 30, 10, very early. It's just focusing on what keeps me up at night, what makes me passionate and uh, understanding that, you know. Not wasting any minute. No, not wasting any minute. Understanding that, you know, I have a, I have a calendar in my room and in my office that has it's a big, very big calendar that shows you the weeks you've lived and the weeks you have to live. And understanding that life is very, very short. It's fragile. It's short. It's a privilege to be living life, right? And you have to take it that way. And every every week, every month that passes is one week less. So embracing every day, every hour, the, you know, the best possible way. I love how you take life. Absolutely. Let me ask you one question, Eduardo. What are the major obstacles that you are facing in Latin America, you know, sort of to accomplish this dream? Is it 
regulation? Is it competition? Is it lack of talent, lack of infrastructure? Sort of what would you like sort of to get rid of? I'll tell you something that's maybe an answer you won't expect. The biggest obstacle in Latin America is not dreaming big enough. When that's something we're trying to change, our culture, with many other companies that have done things incredibly from Latin America to the world, one of our values is actually dream big. You first have to believe in what you're doing. You have to dream it, and then you have to achieve it. Believing you're capable of doing things is something that is probably the biggest part of the equation. Understanding that the most incredible success stories in, in history were done by people that were not different than you and me, that were not as the privileged ones, I think that's important in Latin America that in some countries more than others is not that present. And I think I feel it as part of my personal mission why we're having this conversation today is for entrepreneurs who are living, I don't know, in Arequipa, in Peru, or, or you know, in Monterrey, in Mexico, listening to this and say, ah, he did this. Why can't I do this? And in today's world, Mariana, and let me share this, it's more possible than ever. Ten years ago, Technology and COVID, one of the good things about COVID is that democratized access to capital, democratized access to building things from very various parts of the world. And you don't have to be born in Silicon Valley and to be successful. Um, today, you can be in a small town in rural Mexico, Peru, Chile, wherever it is. You just have to have a big dream, passion, and be able to surround yourself with people who believe the same you are believing, you are dreaming, and, uh, and make it happen, right? And have a ton of resilience, I think. That is also important because the other thing that unfortunately has happened with today's culture is that, you know, we, we want everything right away, right? We see Instagram and everyone's successful. The reality of life, right, is that the obstacle is the way. Postpone gratification, even if you don't see it today. And I think understanding that the obstacles in the way are basically the stepping stones to building what you want to build, I think is a, is a mindset, you know, thing. And, um, and that's probably the most missing let me ask you the last question, Eduardo, before I let you go. If you were to give young Eduardo some advice after everything you have learned, after all your experience, what would you tell? I would tell myself uh, what I just, the obstacle is the way. Remember that that is very, I mean, it's, it's so true. I mean, if I look back in life, Mariana, and I look at my personal and professional life, you know, when my dad passed away, you know, when I was six months in the hospital with my mom, moments that I do not wish for anyone, those are the moments that made me who I am today. And uh, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing and I wouldn't be the person I am today if I hadn't gone through those with the mindset I did. And I think those obstacles, and I think that is applicable to life and to building a company, a family, the dark moments, the moments where you're like, oh my God, why is this happening to me? Those are the moments that life puts in front of you and that make you become who you will become. And how you approach those moments is the definition of your life. So I would, if I had gone back, I would tell myself, you know, trust the process, embrace those difficult moments, embrace the pain, because that is what's going to, you know, make it happen. And Unfortunately, we ran out of time and I could keep on asking you questions and questions, but I know your calendar is very, very busy, so I'm going to let you go. Eduardo, I cannot thank you enough. This was such a wonderful and inspiring conversation. Thank you, Mariana. So you will inspire a lot of younger kids. Really enjoyed the conversation. Incredible how fast it went. So thanks for the invitation. Looking forward to seeing you in person. Very, very let me know when you're in New York.